Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Psalm 33, 12. Say it with me. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Psalm 33, 12. That's your memory verse for today. Let me ask you this. If that's true, which it is, is the reverse of that true? Cursed is the nation whose God is not the Lord. Is our nation right now under the blessing of God? Or are we under judgment right now? The psalmist considered that too. He wrote, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? There's another rendition of this from the Hebrew text, and it's the second one I like the best. When the foundations are being destroyed, what is the righteous one, God? What is he up to? What is he doing? And that's going to be the focal point of this, is what is God up to right now, and what is he calling of every one of you to activate in this point? I, when I graduated from college, now that was right after the Mayflower arrived at Plymouth Rock. <laughs> When I graduated from college, the major network news, ABC, NBC, CBS, one of those, I don't remember which one it was, would end in that city their local news with this scripture, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That's the way they end the news every day. Can you imagine that happening today? The shock you would be in, the joy, but the shock you would be in if you heard that. To pastors across the country, as I speak to them, I've asked this question. How many of your communities are more righteous today, measurably more righteous today than they were 25 years ago? I have never had a pastor ever raise his hand. When the foundations are being destroyed, what's the righteous one doing? What's God up to and calling us to? Everyone knows that the Bible speaks to the personal issues of life. Everyone knows the Bible speaks to the family issues of life. Everybody knows that the Bible speaks to the church or congregational aspects of life. But 99% plus of Christians do not grasp that the Bible speaks with great clarity to civil governance, wow. how government is supposed to function. We think, well, abortion and marriage. No, it speaks to every issue. Right. It was God who invented government. Yeah. Wow. It's God who establishes nations. Yep. Would he invent government, establish nations, and to go, oh, I just forgot about that whole thing when I wrote the book. <laughs> no, he's so passionate, so loving, he laid out in the scripture specifically how government is supposed to function. But we got a problem. We got three problems. Our government doesn't know how to function. In fact, show me a government, any government of any nation, that knows how to function according to biblical principles, and I will show you a nation where human pain, suffering, and poverty is reduced. Show me any nation that violates the biblical principles of governance, and I'll show you a nation where human pain, suffering, and poverty is high and getting higher. The principles of Scripture of how a government is to function are crystal clear. But why does nobody know that in the church? I'll suggest three reasons. One is silent pastors and silent church people. The second one is bad understanding of history. And the third is lack of application of the word. Let's go through those. The first one is silent pastors and church attenders. This does not apply to awakened church. Praise God. I cannot tell you how much I respect your leadership. Jürgen and Leanne and, and, your, and, and Matt and Michaela, the, the, team, the leadership you have is phenomenal. The bold, you don't want to know why Rosemary and I are attending an awakened church? Boldness. It's because you're awakened. We don't want to be woke. We want to be awakened. That's why we're here. That's why we come. Listen to this, 90% of pastors agree that the Bible speaks to the social, cultural, and political issues of the day. Repeat, 90% of pastors agree in a survey that the Bible speaks to the social, uh, political, and cultural issues of the day. In that same survey, when asked, will you preach on what the Bible says about those issues, 90% of the pastors said no, they would not. That's the challenge we face. There's 324,000 Protestant churches in America. How many of those have gone woke, they're leftist, they're libertarian? I mean, not libertarian, they're liberal, uh, they're progressive. The answer is 72%. How many are conservative and Bible-believing churches? The answer 28% across America. That's 100,000 churches. But of those, 
How many of those have a distinctly biblical worldview where they apply the scriptures to every aspect of life, including the governmental realm? The answer is somewhere between 10 and 15,000 churches. It drops dramatically. Some pastors say, well, we only preach Jesus. That sounds cool at first because I preach Jesus. And virtually every time I've ever preached, I give people an opportunity to receive him as Christ as Lord. And I will at the close of this sermon as well. But we don't just preach Jesus. We preach what Jesus preached. <laughs> and what did he preach? He preached the kingdom. A kingdom has a king. Who's the king? Jesus. Over what? Well, some people will say over everything except politics. No, he's the king over it all. He's over all of government. <clears throat> There's no arena he does not claim as his. And then we have silent church attenders. By that, I mean, not an awaken, but by that, I mean, in surveys, they say, do you speak out on the issues? They said, no. I thought the reason they didn't speak on the issues is because they were afraid. They were afraid to be called homophobic, Islamophobic, uh, transphobic, uh, xenophobic, some phobic. Uh, something like that. And, and, but that's not the, the answer they gave. They said, we don't speak out on the issues because we do not know what to say. That's right, yeah. Now, when I heard that, something exploded within me. And I wrote the book at that point. That was in 2016. Wrote the book called Well Versed, which lays out the right. biblical foundations to 30 political topics. Minimum wage, social security, health care, welfare. You name the topic. God has an answer. He has the foundational issues in mind for that. So the book was put out at that particular time. I want you to get this book out to everybody you can. I do not make any funds off of what I'm about to say. I don't get any money from what I'm about to say or the sale of this book. So I can do it freely. But I want to encourage you to get it. I want to make it hard for you to only buy one. So I'm going to run the price on up to 14 bucks, which is about what we get paid. But if you'll buy six or more, a dozen or more, we'll, we'll throw in, we'll drop the price down to $11. You can see it on the screen. And my wife has these beautiful, wonderful Hebrew calendars so you can walk with the Feast of Our Lord according to the biblical calendar, Rosemary, stand up. She's been to Israel 71 times. Yeah. And by the way, I know other family members here in this service today. My sister, Judy, stand if you would. She has an incredible prayer ministry. In the, I won't tell her age, but she completed her master's degree at age 78. Okay? Is that not impressive? And she has an incredible... And she has an incredible ministry of prayer in Washington, D.C., interceding in Washington, D.C. If you're an intercessor, come, meet, come back by the book table and meet her. But then on top of that, my mother is here, and in 26 days, she will turn 101. I hear When my family walked in here, the demographic average age of this church jumped up 15 years. <laughs> if, you want to get, if you want to get a dozen of these books, we're going to throw in this book here, Heaven and the Afterlife. That's about 270 pages. We'll throw that in if you'll get a dozen of them or more. If you get two dozen, that's a case. That's 24. We'll throw in this 500-page version of That's two books put into one called the Heaven and the Afterlife uh, collection. We also have it available in Spanish as well. And we have it available in Portuguese and Hungarian. I'm sure we have a lot of Hungarian speakers here, but you're welcome to pick it up in those languages as well. We want to get that out as fast as possible to teach people what does God have to say about the essence of government today. Number, number two, a wrong history. Separation of church and state is a phrase you've all heard. Where is that in the Constitution? Not there. Where is that in the Declaration of Independence, our birth certificate as a nation? It's not there. Where did it come from? You know this, but I want to make sure everybody knows this. Remember this date, January the 1st, 1802. January the 1st, 1802, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to a group of Baptists in Danbury, Connecticut, who were concerned that the federal government may come in and encroach on their church life. And, and Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter saying, no, we wouldn't dare do that. There's a wall of separation between us. What he said was, the government cannot intrude into the church or religion, but religion is not blocked from coming into government. That's the proper understanding of what he wrote. <clears throat> My wife and I were recently uh, back at Monticello. That's the home, uh, the presidential home of Thomas Jefferson. It's a museum now, and you can take tours of it. 
And we, I'd been here before, but I went back again six weeks ago. We wanted to do kind of a dry run because we're doing a conference in Washington, D.C. Uh, in July, July 20, 21, and 22. We're doing training on how to speak to all these issues that we've been talking about, well-versed. And then we're doing a training on how to keep from being canceled in the cancel culture. By the way, the apostle prophet pastor of the conference, the conference two of them, is Pastors Jurgen and Leanne. There, there's, yeah. There's 40 speakers. They're not speakers, but they're to exhort the congregation anytime they want to, the conference anytime they want to, after any speaker at any point. That's their assigned role to keep us on track, to keep our eyes on Jesus through the whole conference. If you want to just go to Well-Versed uh, World, you can, you can click on a future conference, and we invite you to, to come to that. But the day three, we're loading everybody in buses, and we're taking them to George Washington's Mount Vernon and Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. We were, we were, we were just there. At that, and the lady, the guide said, Thomas Jefferson is the one that came up with separation of church and state. I waited until all, everybody was gone afterwards because I didn't want to embarrass her. But I said, Well, may I correct you just a little bit? I said, Sure. I said, He did not say that. What he wrote was the wall of separation. Another guide overheard, he said, Yes, that's correct, the wall of separation. I said, And what did that mean? That meant that religion could still come into the government, the government can go into religion. That's what he meant, and he defined it very clearly. And how do we know that's what he meant? Is because he supported, encouraged, and attended weekly church services, Christian preaching services in the U.S. Capitol building every Sunday. And they went from 1800 to 1869, worship services preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in our U.S., not in the rotunda, it wasn't built yet, but in Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol building, Thomas Jefferson would put his Bible under his arm and ride his horse down Pennsylvania Avenue and attended those services where the Marine Band provided the worship for the Christian services in the U.S. Capitol. Yeah. <clears throat> I had the privilege with a buddy of mine of starting what we call Jefferson Gathering to honor him, restarting weekly worship services in the U.S. Capitol building in July of 2014. Now, it's morphed into Bible studies with, with members of Congress, but we had the privilege of starting something that had ended to back in 1869. There's a second thing you'll hear. It's not the separation of church and state. Understand it properly, because there's a cultural myth that people think, oh, church is separate. Can you imagine God saying, yeah, you got to rule me out of that which I invented, government. And then there's a second one. Well, no pastor should ever speak politics from the pulpit. He shouldn't endorse or oppose a candidate. Where does that come from? It's what's called the Johnson Amendment. What is it? It was passed in July the 2nd, 1954. I wish I could tell you the whole story behind that. I don't have the time to do that, but let me just say this much about it. It has never been tested in a court all this time, and people have bought into the cultural myth. It is in violation of the First Amendment of the Constitution. So a group of attorneys, 3,000 Christian attorneys called Alliance Defending Freedom, ask pastors to rise up and intentionally defy that unconstitutional amendment, the Johnson Amendment. I had the privilege of leading that. They asked me to be the head of it. And it was the uh, Pulpit Freedom Sunday. Thousands of pastors, thousands of pastors from the pulpit openly endorsed or opposed a candidate, recorded it, sent it to the IRS to provoke a lawsuit. We wanted a lawsuit. And not a, sing not, not a single one of us got sued. We wanted to be sued. Why would they not sue us? They apparently thought they would lose in court, which they would, because it's a violation of the First Amendment of the Constitution. Now, the IRS would send back little postcards that says, thank you, we received your sermon. They got thousands of sermons. <laughs> Somebody must have gotten saved there. <laughs> We've never seen any evidence of that yet. The third thing is the lack of the word. What do I mean by that? I was talking to a friend of mine by the name of Bill. Bill stood taller than me. I pastored a large church. His church was considerably larger than mine. He was towering over me in height, and he looked down on me both physically and figuratively one day and says, I'm not political like you, Jim. I looked back up at him. I said, Bill, my problem with you is not that you're not political. My problem with you is you're not biblical. Oh, let me tell you exactly what I mean, Bill. If I were a slave in 1860 and my slave owner were going to go to a church, would I want that slave owner to go to Bill's church or Jim's church? 
The answer is Jim's church, because I'll expose the sin of racism manifested in slavery and call that person to account to set you free. But you won't be political. If I was a baby in the womb of a 14-year-old girl who lived close to Planned Parenthood, would I want that 14-year-old girl to go to Bill's church or Jim's church? The answer is Jim's church. I'll do whatever I can to save the life of that baby and help her through this process so she didn't have to do that, what she's about to do. I, says, I was ordained a part of the Wesleyan denomination. I said, Bill, you know where that came from? The Wesleyans were formed in 1843 when the slavery uh, issue couldn't be discussed anymore among Methodists. They refused to allow them to discuss the slavery issue, afraid that it would offend the slave owners in the South, and they would stop tithing and leave the church, so they couldn't talk about it anymore. So a group of Methodist church says, we've had it. They walked out, and they formed the Wesleyan Methodist Church, which was a radical abolitionist group, and our early churches were one day's journey apart from each other so we could smuggle the slaves out of the South into the North into the Underground Railroad. I said, you know how they treated us in South Carolina? They hung Makaija McPherson, a Wesleyan, because he was a part of that. They took the rope down a little too early and managed to miraculously barely survive. There was an expression in that county in South Carolina, there's not enough rope to hang all the Wesleyans here. I said, was that too political, Bill, or was that biblical? The answer is that was biblical. Now, you're commanded by Scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. You're commanded to pray for those in authority, but you cannot pray for them if you do not know them. You need to know your assemblyman, your senator, your two state U.S. senators, your, your member of Congress, and your mayor. You can't pray for people you do not know. And so I call you to find out, make sure you know who they are. Even seek appointments with them the can you, way you can. In a moment, I'm going to introduce a group of people who are running for office right now. And I encourage you to lift them up and pray and get acquainted with them in the lobby afterwards. Paul said in Romans, let everyone be subject to the authorities. This is the most abused text about the government I've ever heard. He says, be, be subject to the government. So simply as, oh, we can't challenge them, I think. No, no, if they say take COVID, we just got to take our COVID vaccine. We can't, we can't refuse. We can't, we can't go against anything in the government. They, no, no, we can't dare do that. That's not what the text says. It says the government is to be ordained by God to be the minister of God. The word is diakonos in the Greek, in the original language. That means a servant of God or a minister of God. Now, if you're in a monarchy where there's a king, you can't do much about making your government act right. If you're in an oligarchy, you can't do much but you're in what's called a constitutional republic. Don't say we're in a democracy. We're not. We're in a constitutional republic. There's a difference. We vote democratically, but we're in a constitutional republic. If you're in a constitutional republic, who's the government? You. We the people. We are the ones to make sure our government functions as the minister of God, the diakonos. That's you that's to do that. Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson both love this phrase. Benjamin Franklin wants this to be our national model. Quote, Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. That's our saying. We have a ministry called Well Versed. We meet with members of government anytime we can, bringing biblical principles of governance to government leaders. We had, before COVID, COVID has changed a lot. We had weekly Bible studies going with members of, of Congress, and then we had a weekly Bible study in the United Nations. We're not a large ministry. We're a small ministry, but we've had the privilege of our small ministry meeting privately with 93 of the 193 ambassadors at the United Nations. And we had the privilege of meeting with a few presidents and prime ministers, not as many as I hope to someday. But we have to, as Christians, be sufficiently sophisticated and erudite to know how do you work with governmental leaders who are not one of us, and yet that God has miraculously put into position for carrying out His wills. We have in a number of nations, a number of high-level government people who are clearly not one of us. Now, ideally, I'd want every person to be elected to be filled with the Spirit of Christ and, and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes you have to have a Cyrus. A Cyrus wasn't one of the Jews, but he performed what God ordained that protected the Jews. And so sometimes we have to work. We recognize how to work with individuals who are not one of us but are, are operating in God's flow in doing biblical principles. We had the privilege of meeting with uh, President al-Sisi in Egypt, for example. Remarkable what he's doing as a Muslim in a Muslim country, predominantly Muslim country. He's re helping rebuild all the Christian churches that were torn down and burnt and torched, and including dedicating the largest one in that whole region. In Kurdistan, we met with the Prime Minister Barzoni. Remarkable his fierce commitment to Israel, 
fierce commitment even to America. The king of Jordan, King Abdullah II, met with him, a remarkable time. He's very committed to Israel. They had wars in the past with Israel. Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, he's not the current one, but with the exception of his, some of his last rulings, he gave, he gave tremendously biblical leadership to that nation. Uh, uh, Hernandez in Honduras, he's out of office actually at this time, but he gave tremendous leadership during that time. Brazil, pray for President Bolsonaro in Brazil. What he's going through there, he's called the Trump of the tropics. And he is being, uh, he is being attacked by the media, falsely accused, as much as President Trump ever was. It's staggering. Even when he was campaigning, they stabbed him, physically stabbed him. He's had a string of surgeries, a dozen or more surgeries, to try to overcome the harm of the stabbing that took place. When I was, we were been with him twice, and the last time I was with him, you could see on his countenance how heavy it was, the bulletproof vest that he was wearing, trying to take him out. And a man who's doing what is right in biblical principles, Guatemala, Jimmy Morales. Now, he had a background like Trump's. It wasn't a godly background at all. But what he did for biblical principles was staggering. And the president, the current one, we met with Jimmy Morales when he was president, but now Giamatti, President Giamatti. And, and he is def most definitely not one of us, and yet he is walking and fiercely committed to walking in biblical principles of governance, has asked godly pastors to surround him and guide him how to lead that nation. The result... The result, he has stood, and can't believe the price he's paying for this. He is standing for life in the womb, and he's standing for the definition of marriage, one man, one woman. Our own State Department, which is filled with evil people, our own State Department does unbelievable pressure on them. I wish I had time to tell you the stories. They'll take away financial aid. They'll take away military support. They'll do everything to literally remove the leader. They do things to try to get the leader out who stands for protecting life in the womb, and Mary, this is all over the world this happens from our State Department. And Jeremati is a man standing convictionally. Bolivia, Janine Añez, there was a prayer meeting. It broke out. You got a million and a half people in the streets praying. And all of a sudden, the, the communist dictator ran for her and took, took off. And she was swept into power. There's number two guy whiz, number three is number four, number five. She was number six in succession for the presidency and suddenly became the president overnight of Bolivia. Janine Añez. But the story does not end well. The communists came back in, took control of Bolivia. She is in prison. She did nothing wrong. She's in prison. She's been very close to death. We've been trying to call attention to her situation. A godly, godly woman, her, her brother is an evangelical pastor in that, in that country. Hungary, probably the most biblically grounded government in the world. We have the, uh, Tristan Ajbez become a friend of ours. He's the secretary, state secretary of, of Hungary. Hungary is so biblically grounded they will do anything to protect life in the womb and the definition of marriage. On top of that, you know, what, you know what the state secretary's task is? Tristan's task? He's to find Christians that are being persecuted anywhere in the Christian, anywhere in the world and save them. This is a country of only 10 million people. And they're doing everything they can. Victor Orban just got reelected. Praise God. And our own, uh, the president of our country supported his opponent who was a communist anti-Semite. But miraculously, Victor Orban was reelected. Praise God. He is so committed to the family. If a young, they want couples to get married and have babies. And they will support them in them. If you get married and have a baby, they'll start helping to support you. If you have two babies, they'll, they'll cancel one half your student debt. If you have three babies, they'll cancel all your student debt. If you start having babies, they will help you get a house. They will help you buy a van. The bigger the van, the happier they are with it. Many of you young couples just think about moving to Budapest right now. <laughs> they're serious. I mean, there's billboards all over from the state. Family is right. Family is good. Families to be protected. <laughs> We've been in Ukraine. We love Ukraine. I didn't put this picture, but Ivan Benikoff, the number two to Zelensky. We, had to, we were invited to be, come over and meet with Zelensky last September. We did not make it. But pray for Ukraine in this very, very, very painful time. But there's been, in, in contrast to all you hear about the corruption of Ukraine, which does, there has been corruption there. The fact is, there's been a great outpouring of the Spirit of God. So amazing things spiritually. So I wish I had time to tell you about it. And, and then President Trump. Some Christians were so offended at his mean tweets. I'll just tell you, I served for, for five years, four years on his uh, faith advisory board. I'm telling you, the man wanted to do what was right. 
rough around the edges. I admit that. I admit that. He probably wouldn't be pastor of our church. But for, in terms of God placing him in position, 98% of his policies were right on highest percentage of any president we have ever had. It's been staggering. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to take action to be biblically informed. Biblically informed. I am so proud of Awaken. Last Sunday, I listened to Jürgen Mateskis. I listened to him at Eastlake. And here, the powerful sermon. I thought, man, I wish we could get this to the whole world. And he even mentioned things like Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum, globalism. He didn't take time to define any of them. You know why? He either knew his crowd was so sophisticated, they knew what all that was, or they're smart enough, they'll Google it and they'll learn immediately because he was calling out those issues. That's the kind of church I like being a part of, a kind of church that understands that. <laughs> Biblically informed. Register to vote. Dran Reese is going to be back there. If, if Everybody who's registered, raise your hand. Everybody who's registered, raise your hand. If you're not registered, make sure you stop that register to vote. Educate others. 90 million Christians are eligible to vote. 40 million Christians don't vote. 15 million Christians are not even registered to vote. The thing I love about Awaken, you take Jesus into everything. You take Jesus into your family, into your marriage, into your business, your relationships, your finances, your school, your private life, your sexual life. You take Jesus into the voting booth. The reason, the reason politics is dirty is because so many clean people got out of it. But we take Jesus into the voting booth. That's what we do here. Virginia, let me take you to the, the, the state of Virginia. The previous governor advocating killing babies after they were born. That's Governor Northam. Now we have that going on at AB 2223 in Sacramento right now, in our own state. Now, two years later, we have a governor that calls people and prays with them in the name of Jesus. What happened? How did we go from Northern to Yonkin? I'll tell you exactly what happened in that election. A pastor, none of you know him, Brian Fox, an independent Baptist pastor. He said, we can't let this go on. He helped raise up and train, with the help of my buddy Chad Conley, a thousand poll watchers and 300 election judges. They went to the elections to see if we could have a fair, an honest election again in this country. And they threw out all those votes that were dead people voting. They identified them and threw out their ballots. And that's what happened. <laughs> what do you ask a candidate when you're with a candidate? The first question you ask, what's the purpose of government? Well, so Brian Jones will know that. Brian Jones was a pastor. He served, uh, he served as city council. He served as assemblyman. He served as senator. Brian Jones is the mob. If you want to get some training, get it from Brian Jones. You'll meet, meet him in just, in just a moment. I'm going to call them all up here in a second. But what do you ask a candidate? You ask a candidate, first of all, the issue, what's the purpose of government? Number two, you ask them, are you a commitment to life? Are you visceral? They'll say, well, I'm privately pro-life, but no, I don't care about your private views on it. Will you be legislatively visceral about it and fight for the life of the unborn? That's what we care about. And will you defend the family? I want the candidates to all come up here right now on the stage. Come quickly. Come quickly. Grand, come up here. Grand, come up here. Okay. Grand, Grand is not a candidate, but she's head of biblicalvoter.com. Go to biblicalvoter.com. It tells you everything. And Grand's the one that invited her. Grand Reese. She'll be out there at the table to help register. Get acquainted with her and find out how to jump on board. I'm going to say a name. When I say your name, raise your hand. Cordy Williams. Run, don't clap because wait till, wait, wait till we get the end. Cordy Williams running for U.S. Senate. James Bradley, U.S. Senate. Matthew Sinquanta, Secretary of State. Brian Mar Marriott, U.S. Congress 49. Josiah O'Neill, U.S. Congress 49. Jonathan Peck, Sheriff San Diego. Brian Jones, the one I referred to. Get trained by this guy. He's been in office since 2010. And he knows, and he's up there in the lion's den in Sacramento. That, man, that, you deserve a purple heart for that, sir. <laughs> Christy Bruce Lane, California Assembly, District 76. Melanie Burkholder, Carlsbad City Council, District 1. Becca Williams, School Board, San Diego. Jen, Jim, Jim Gibson, Superintendent of Public Instruction. I want to pray over you, Father God. Thank you for people having the courage to run for office. I pray supernatural protection around them. I pray finances to flow towards them, favor to flow towards them. 
bless them in every arena, protect them in their marriages, their private life, their personal life, every arena of their life. Give them strength for this journey. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, let's just slip down, but let's hear it for them as they go. Amen. Thank you, man. I love you. Man. Be sure and go encourage them and pray over them, get their material, ask how you can help them, because running for office is extremely hard. I've been active politically since age nine. August the 13th of my ninth year, I became an activist at that, at that point. Now, I know they say you, know, you should never discuss politics and religion in our home. That's all we ever did discuss. discuss. We loved it. Now, I said the first question is, what's the purpose of government? You ask a candidate. Number question number two, you ask the question, are you committed to defending life? Because if a baby can't down, make it down the birth canal, none of the other liberties matter. Number three, will you support the fundamental building block of all society? That's one man, one woman marriage. Now, let me tell you why that's important. Walk me through this. Here we go. God established an order in Genesis. The first order was gender specificity, male and female. There's just two. Here we go. And then the, he established marriage. Now that's Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 4, he established procreation, having children. Now, what did the enemy do? He went after in reverse order those three fundamental things. The first thing, attacking babies in the womb, abortion, 1973, Roe v. Wade. By the way, Roe v. Wade, Roe stands for Jane Roe. That's a pseudonym for Norma McCorvey. It was built on a lie. She admitted it was all a lie. Wade is Henry Wade, the district attorney of Dallas, where the case came from. Norma McCorvey, that's Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade, came to Christ, was led to Christ by my buddy, Flip Benham. He brought her three days later to a church for the first time. She was terrified to come to a church. She thought Christians would hate her. She came to the church I pastored in Dallas, Fort Worth, that Sunday. With her permission, I announced that she was present and she had just received Jesus as Lord. The congregation exploded just like you would. They clapped and cheered forever, lined up for one hour, greeting and hugging her and welcoming her, welcoming her into the kingdom after that happened. And by the way... The place for that whole Wade versus uh, Roe v. Wade case took place is now apartments, and it's occupied by people holding prayer meetings in that place. <laughs> Number two, marriage. The enemy destroyed marriage in Ober Obergefell case in 2015. And then in 2020, the transgender Harris Funeral Homes versus EEOC. Now, why is marriage such a big deal? Why such an attack upon marriage? Divorce attacks marriage, pornography attacks marriage, homosexuality attacks marriage, transgenderism, all these attacks on marriage. Why the attack on marriage? Now, I'm going to wade pretty deep. I'm going the deep end of the pool. Fasten your seatbelts. I hope you have your cell phones open, 55525, so you can follow the notes so you have them when you take them home. What's coming on the screen? God is neither male nor female. The scripture writers, when they talk about God, they talk sometimes about his masculinity in terms of his strength. But other times, the Bible writers in the Old Testament, they'll describe him as, 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 as a woman with breastfeeding a newborn. They'll give tenderness and nurturing language to God. Sometimes even as having a womb giving birth. God is neither male nor female. Now, we're made in the image of God. However, no male by himself is a full expression of the full spectrum of the image of God. No female by herself is a full, uh, the full spectrum of the full image of God. Only as a male and female come together in covenant marriage, the two halves of humanity complete each other and are a representation of the full spectrum of the image of God. Now, let me take you further. If you have an NIV Bible, there are going to be footnotes covering what I'm saying to you right now. Adam, when God created Adam, here's the traditional view. God created Adam, and then he took a rib and he made, he made Eve. That's what the English sounds like. That's not what the Hebrew text, the original language is saying. Let me unpack it for you. Fasten your seatbelts. When God created humanity, he created Adam. That's, that's chapter 2, verse 7. Small a, not capital A, a man named Adam. 
small a, he created humanity. He looked at that, and it's the only time God looked at his creation and said, that's not good. What was not good about what he created? He says, it's alone. The translation can be, it's as one. In other words, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had relationship capability, but he created Adam, humanity, with no capability for relationship. He looked at Adam, humanity, he had created, and he says, that's not good. It's as one. And at that point, he removed Selah. It's almost like Tesla, only S and E are switched around in the spelling. He removed Selah. What's Selah? It gets mistranslated in your Bible as rib. It's used 40 times in the Old Testament. This is the only time it's translated that way. It means side or half. It's not talking about a rib. Now, here it, God created Adam, humanity. Here's humanity. Then he says, that's like, it's all one. It's not good. No relationship came up. Then he pulled Selah. The word there in Hebrew, Selah, means half or side. He pulled one half apart, and now we have femininity, and we have now masculinity. And that's part of the reason for the sex drive in a healthy way, the sex drive in a healthy way, the, the, the hunger for the two complementary halves of humanity to come back together and complete what was pulled apart in Genesis. Now, let me go further. Let's go to the Hebrew words themselves. Watch the screen. Here we go. Ish. Ish is the name for man. There are three letters. In Hebrew, you go from right to left. Now, you have this in your cell phone, so you can kind of go through this again if I go too fast. The middle letter here is Yod, Aleph Yod Shin. Yod is what you want you to remember. The word for woman is Isha. This is in Hebrew. And it's Aleph Shin He. There is one letter in man that is not in woman. There's one letter in woman that's not in man. What is it? Yod He. We bring the Yod He down here. That forms the word for Yahweh, the Lord God, which is used 6,800 times in your Old Testament. In other words, let's go to the next screen, just review this one more time so we can see it. Here we go. We take the word man, we take that middle letter yod out and bring it down. We take this last letter, hey, and bring it down here. We have yod, hey, vav, hey. That's the foundation for the word Yahweh by God. And so as a man and woman come together, they form the full spectrum of Yahweh. The name of God is stamped on the very name of man and woman. Two men do not do that. Two women do not do that. It says a man and a woman. Let's go to the next slide. Now we're going to see it again. We're taking Yod up there, the God. Hey, up there, and that forms the name for God. But what's left? Aleph, Shin. Let's take them down, and they're identical. What does that word mean? It means fire. Let me ask you a question. Is fire good or bad? Well, it depends where it is. If it's 2003 in San Diego or 2007 San Diego when a fire broke loose and took out 2,800 homes or 1,600 homes in 2007, that's not good. But as fire is controlled, it's very good. It's powering the lights. It's powering this amplifier. It started your car this morning. If you fix some coffee, you use fire. Controlled fire. Your cell phone you'll be using in a few moments or you're using right now to follow these notes. That's by fire. There's controlled fire. So fire can be a very good thing if it's within parameters. Unleashed, it is out of control. Go to the next slide. Let's watch what happens. We're doing a review here now. Isha, it's woman. Ish, man. We've taken out the green and the blue, and we formed the name for Yahweh God. We already talked about that. But we've got this thing, fire, ish, ish, left over. Let's talk about it. We're going to take another word, the fire that's the sexual energy between a man and a woman the, mm, that draws them together, the chemistry that is there. I want to take you to the word covenant. What happens if we add covenant, the covenant of marriage to this? Look what happened. Here's covenant. This is the word berit. It's pronounced berit. It's the word covenant. You go from right to, uh, from right to left. The covenant of marriage. Marriage is not a contract. It is a covenant. It's permanent. Now, I'm going to split this word apart. I'm going to take two letters and shove them that way and two letters and shove them this way. I want to put the word fire right in the middle. Next slide. Here we go. We've taken the word reet for covenant, divided it into two letters and two letters. We've taken the word fire ish from man and woman and shoved it up in there. And now we have a word called bear a sheet. This is the power of fire, the attraction of a man and a woman 
within the parameters of covenantal marriage. That is good. The, the act of marriage between a husband and wife is a holy and righteous act in the concept of covenant. What is the word Bereshit? It's translated in English in the beginning. That's the first word of your Bible. The very first word of your Bible is Bereshit. The Jews do not call the book of Genesis, Genesis. Jews call their book Bereshit. In other words, tucked away, by the way, three different Jewish rabbis taught me everything I'm telling you right now. Tucked away in the first, very first word of the Bible is the nature of covenantal marriage. Now that's just, we're just in Genesis alone. Time doesn't permit us to go into Revelation. But if we did, I would walk through the same exact thing in Revelation. Why does the enemy want to destroy the nature of marriage? To try to destroy the image of God upon the earth. That's what he's up to. That's why the attacks on marriage, every country we go to, the attack upon marriage is staggering. We could tell you stories all over the world. The attack on one institution, marriage, and then the family that comes from that. Why? The attempt by the evil one to rise up and use people in wrong ways to attack that which God has established when he stamped his image upon the earth. But I got to wrap this up. And let me just say this. My goal in preaching, I want to get you, I want to make sure you're active, informed, meet these candidates, spend some time with them, register to vote. But my goal is not to produce nice little conservative, politically active people. My goal is to produce Jesus followers filled with his spirit who are dangerous, dangerous to Satan. Come on. That's the goal. And you are not the least bit dangerous to Satan if you're just a nice little political person. You are a threat to the evil one. When you become a contagious character, carrier, contagious carrier of Jesus Christ, a plain clothesman in the Jesus revolution, the only revolution that will ultimately conquer the hearts and minds of humankind. And I want to make sure before I leave, and i got to wrap this up, that every one of you have an opportunity to receive Christ as Savior. The saint is not too troubled with everything he's heard so far, but he's really about to get frustrated with what I'm going to present. You need to know Jesus personally in your heart and walk with him in every aspect of your life. Many of you are, but some of you came here today without an assurance of that. This is your moment for change. The most important day of your life is right now today to come to Christ personally and to know him. How do you do that? By saying, Jesus, I need you to come into my life. I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes. No one looking around. Everyone with eyes closed. Repeat after, I'm going to have everyone repeat after me, but this is just for those of you who want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Dear Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. Come into my heart. Come into my, heart. Come into my life. Come into my life. I, repent I repent of my sins. I turn from my sins. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. Become my Savior. Become my Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. No one looking around, all eyes closed. If you prayed that prayer for the purpose of receiving Christ in your heart right now, wherever you are, raise your hand and wave it to me so I can see it. Wave it kind of high. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Keep your hands up. Wonderful. Wonderful. Every one of you that raised your hands, look at me right now. Pastor, join me up here. Whoever's pastor presiding. Those of you with your hands raised near, our pastor friend is going to tell you exactly what to do, where to go right now. But this decision you're making is the most important decision of your entire life. Thank you. Bless you, brother. Oh, come on. Can we, can we give it up for Dr. Jim Garlo? I told y'all. I told you. Absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. The power of revelation, the power of seeing correctly. Uh, now, everyone that raised your hand, everyone that responded to that opportunity to receive Jesus, we want to make sure that you leave here equipped. And so we want to give you a book called The Bible, which is what Dr. Jim is preaching. And it's the word of God. And we have that gift for you down here. We've got team all around that saw you raise your hands and they'll come to you. But if they don't come to you, make sure you come to them. And we've got a book called Following Jesus, which will help you start to know how do I read this book? What do I do next? We've got those next steps. And then we've got some different things happening. We've got Wednesday night water baptisms. we got freedom night. We have men's prayer all 
together this Tuesday, all together. So we're believing for 300 men to come on Tuesday. It's going to be powerful. Uh, but church, I want to make sure before we leave that and everyone could, could, could stand up because we're going to wrap here. And I want to pray for you. And then I'm going to have our ministry team come down. Because what happens when truth is presented is when we're living incongruently, it can agitate some things. I remember growing up completely incongruent from the way I live now because I did not live in a household where the word of God was, was established. I lived growing up Catholic and Jewish, so I had a mixed, mixed bag in the sense of what is right and what is wrong. And so growing up, I believed marriage could be kind of whatever it wanted to be. I believed that you could do whatever you want when it came to, you know, if you got pregnant and you could get abortion. I, I didn't really have a conviction either way, but it's because truth wasn't established in my life. So that when I came into this house and truth was established, I began to get a little bit agitated, meaning there's, there's a way that is right. that looks right to a man, but its way ends in death. But there is a way, and his name is Jesus. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. So when I surrendered, when I submitted completely to Jesus, which is what we do when we're believers, that means that my thought processes, that means the way that I view po politics, that means the way that I view everything is actually submitted to his lordship. And so what we don't want you to do is just leave here agitated, leave here disgruntled, leave here unsure. We want you to come down and actually receive prayer and believe that as you surrender, as you submit, God, I don't know what to do about this because it's not how I grew up. It's not what I think, but I'm submitting to you that God would actually minister to you through our ministry team and through the Holy Spirit. So why don't you lift your hands and then make sure to get out in the foyer and make sure to support with time, with money, these candidates, meet them, encourage them, get a part of what they're doing and because uh, they'll be out there and Dr. Jim will be signing books as well. So Father, we thank you for every person in this room. Father, we thank you that today, truth is established in our lives. Father, we submit, we surrender to your will, to your way, and to your word. Father, we thank you that as we do that, that seeds would begin to germinate of life in life abundantly. Father, we thank you that your plan is to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask, think, or imagine in our homes, in our marriage, in our family, in our finances, in our city, in our state. And Father, we thank you that the rest of our life will be the best of our life because we trust in you in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our locations, team, and what we do here at Awakened Church, go to awakenedchurch.com.